Ah, ich habe mal die Connect. Okay, great. That's fine. Also kannst du sie dazu nehmen. Ich gehe auf Mute bei mir. Ich kann es auch machen. Warte, ich mache es. Genau. Okay. Gut. Also, ciao, ciao. Oh, great. I can see Maren. Better be. Can you hear us, Juan? Yes, I can listen perfectly well. Hi, Marin. Okay. Good morning, Juan. Really Hi. nice to see you. Excellent. Where are can you in Managua? Yes, I am in Managua. Juan, Enjoying the world, okay. world weather here. I can see the back of Peter Beach also. <laughs> okay. So, Juan, it's in the middle of night for you. Sorry for that. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> That's we great. Have the chance to exchange and uh, it, it's, the communication is really good. I think. Okay. That's good. So, um, you can hear me, I can hear you. Can you see the presentation? Uh, let me check. Uh, no, uh, well, I can see the, the video yes. myself. Uh, a, little, yes, a little bit of the presentation now, but the camera okay. is uh, a bit far away. Uh, so, but I think okay. it will work quite well because the sound is good as long as we are using the microphones. Okay, that's fine. So uh, I will be passing the microphone to uh, to everyone who speaks. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. And then, how, um, how good are you listening to me? Uh, uh, and how good is the participant in the room uh, listening? Sorry. How good are the sound from my side? But it, it is really good. I mean, it's a big room, and uh, so um, let, let me see. Here is the here is the video. So you want me to play that? Did you know that there are different loans that come with different costs and benefits? Let's learn. We will learn financial education through combination of one videos with key messages, two interactive exercises, and three. Questions. A loan is money borrowed that has to be paid back, usually together with a cost as a charge for borrowing. Do I have to click the next here? No, no, no. Nothing, nothing. Nothing. No. 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 Juan, can you hear me now as well? Can you hear me when I speak like this? A little bit far away, yes, but I can... Uh, but you can hear me. Okay, because then uh, for me it would be better if I can speak to the micro like this. Mm -hmm. All right? Okay, perfect. Okay, Juan, so um, we start in about um, five minutes. Mm -hmm. And then we will have a, a overall introduction, yeah. Sure. And then we will, we will put you on screen uh, after the overall uh, introduction. Or, or let, let me check. Maybe we, we keep you uh, we, we keep you on screen uh, during all. Let, let me just check. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 
aware of these. Yeah. Yes. Okay, it's my second child. <laughs> yeah, so if you're you're just uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes, in fact, maybe if you can tell us about this. Are you busy? Uh, I'm actually, well, we have a lot of but I'm making yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Uh, sorry, I, I have a question. I cannot see the PowerPoint presentation when I share my screen. Will you be uh, putting the PowerPoint presentation in the other screen? But um, you you let run the, your PowerPoint presentation, right? Right? Yes. Okay, but you cannot see it. Uh, let me check. <laughs> because uh, he has disconnected you now and I have to, to leave you for, for a few seconds and then um, we will have the, the overall introduction, Juan. Okay. We will have the overall introduction starting in about five minutes and then uh, I, I, when I come up in, in about 10 to 20 minutes, we will co reconnect to you again. Is that fine with you? Okay, that that that's fine. Yeah, and then for the presentation, you you let them run, right? Uh, uh, the presentation you will have that my presentation in uh, right, right? What? Uh, you will have my PowerPoint presentation in the right screen because when I share my screen, I am I can only see my. Now, Juan, you will try to, to, to run the presentation. If this doesn't work, I, I will, will try to do it, right? Yes, you can do it using the screen that is on the left. But, but you try to let it run. Can you see it now? I can Good see morning. it, but when I share my screen, you cannot see my screen. Okay, this is perfect. This is now run. Okay. So should I run it or will you? No, you better run it and I keep it on the email. <laughs> Okay. Um, so Chris, you wanna talk about you can, I don't know, you, you know a little bit about the project, you can somehow. Yeah. I think we will maybe be a bit shorter than uh -huh. the other two. Okay. Hi, Juan. So, Juan Alexander is here. Hi. So now it's time to start. We will reconnect to you in in about 10 to 20 minutes, fine? Fine, excellent. Okay, thank you, Juan. So I stop this. We leave it like, like, it, like it is, yeah, right? Yeah, so leave it open if you like it. Yeah. 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 God, we did. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, now you can also choose your trunk screen. Yep. And then we'll yep. Okay. Fine. Thank you so much. Uh, do we know the password? <laughs> <laughs> 
Hello? Hello? <laughs> okay, uh, welcome everybody. I would like to ask you to take a seat uh, as we are now officially starting. And um, so, and I will give a word to Esther Bau from Swissri. Um, who's going to welcome us on behalf of Swissri. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome here at Swissri's headquarters. I assume uh, some of you have been here before at uh, other general assemblies, others may be new. You are a bit unfortunate with the timing. In a few months, uh, you would have had the privilege to have this meeting in our new headquarters uh, next door. So in uh, September, uh, we will be uh, moving into, or at least some of us, unfortunately not, not everyone, seems our team will be staying in this office, but uh, we will certainly enjoy uh, the new facilities uh, for, for meetings like this, but also other um, client meetings. So, you know, if you want to see it, then uh, come back in a couple of years again with your uh, meeting. It's a, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to, to have you here. And it has also been a pleasure and privilege to observe how SCBF has evolved over the past few years. I've always observed it a little bit from a distant, but distance, but uh, regularly briefed uh, by, uh, by Mario. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's, re it's remarkable how it has evolved and how it has established itself as a, an important platform for the collaboration between the private financial sector and the public sector in Switzerland. It has uh, matured in terms of uh, the, the processes, the infrastructure, the, the projects, etc. And that's, uh, that's a very good um, sign. At uh, Swiss Re, um, we are very keen uh, to, uh, you know, be part of such platforms, particularly in our team. Um, the global partnerships team at Swiss Re was founded a little over five years ago um, in order to develop new business with the public sector uh, at different levels at directly working with governments, but also uh, with um, the public sector as development institutions in order to develop microinsurance solutions. And this fits uh, all very nicely with uh, Swiss Re's overall uh, mission. Uh, we, you may have seen that, it's, it's uh, publicly documented, if you wish, as our uh, mission to make the world more resilient. This sounds very grand, very ambitious, but maybe also a little bit vague and broad. But really the idea is that to, to put in more efforts to make sure that people are financially resilient when shocks occur in their lives and they need to have the financial means to cope with those shocks. We know finance is not everything. Uh, but that's our business, that's our core business, and it's the business of all of us uh, represented in the room in the financial sector. Uh, we know that in order to reach uh, the most vulnerable people in the world uh, with such instruments to enable them to cope with the financial shocks, we need to be very innovative and find new ways. And most importantly, all um, stakeholders need to work together. So we have uh, recognized uh, that this is what we do um, at, uh, at Swiss Re with a goal, with a view of not, not coming from a pure charity perspective, but actually from a business perspective, with definitely with a bottom line um, view on this, in the sense that we do get more time to develop this business than maybe other parts of Swiss Re. Um, we have we can put in more resources 
uh, we can leverage other resources better, but in the end, it has to be profitable, otherwise it's not um, sustainable. So that's, uh, that's the clear view um, that we have at Swiss Re, and that's how we approach this type of business, if you wish. Um, our experience with um, SCBF um, has been um, very rewarding. We have um, endorsed a number of projects uh, in the insurance sector um, over the past few years, and it has demonstrated that you can make a difference. It's, there are always little gaps here and there uh, that need to be filled, and uh, the platform, the SCBF platform, has proven uh, effective and successful, and I would like to highlight in particular is that it's also uh, un, fairly unbureaucratic uh, compared to, to other um, facilities, I would say, um, and uh, that's also something that, that we do appreciate. We have also realized that uh, the partners, our local partners that we have endorsed in applying to SCBF, not only value the financial contribution from SCBF, but they also value the network that uh, this community provides. Uh, they also establish new contacts, uh, develop new networks, and that is so absolutely critical um, in this field. Whatever we do in the insurance space, it is a complex, multi-stakeholder effort to create the necessary ecosystem so that insurance solution can be uh, developed for the most vulnerable um, in the world. But we would like to see more. We'd like to see more projects uh, all over the world. We'd like to see more projects endorsed by, by SCBF. Um, and, uh, you know, we encourage you all to, to keep the eyes open, identify partners, submit uh, projects, and uh, because there is so much that needs to be done um, in this field. We are making uh, progress, slow progress, I would say, but uh, what we have seen over the past few years is um, also, you know, some developments, some changes, the way projects are being approached, the lessons that different partners have learned. So in the early stages uh, of, of microinsurance, um, I would say projects have been mainly driven by NGOs. Um, in this world. And that has, uh, they have done a fantastic job in putting insurance on the agenda, in testing out new concepts. But many, many times these projects um, remained in pilot phase, did not scale up. So we have to be mindful that whenever we identify projects, there is a master plan from the beginning of how to reach scale, that there's a business case, there's a clear business plan, and then we can see how does SCBF fit in and can make a contribution to actually make them fly. Um, we can still start with a, with a pilot, but the pilot has to be structured within a bigger, uh, bigger plan. Over the past uh, few years, we see new players coming into the field of microinsurance, um, often startup companies, often specialized intermediaries, um, often with a technology angle to make this whole uh, process more um, efficient. And I think that's a, that's a healthy development. Um, often these startups, they are coming a bit more from a commercial angle but still are, um, do need the support from the public sector. Because as I said before, nobody can do it alone. You need, uh, you need very different partners. And as I, said, as I said before, and as I like to call it, to create this ecosystem of partners and networks that allows to, to reach out to the people, which is a key challenge for the insurance industry. So who has the access to the people um, to develop the products, to use all different technology, uh, technological means that are available and technology is progressing rapidly. Um, so to stay abreast, to become more efficient, 
you need different partners um, to make it happen. And here, uh, I think SCBF can play a great role in linking different partners, in making sure things, good ideas, do not die because um, there's a piece of financial education missing um, or there's a, a, another piece uh, missing that requires support to get it off the ground, um, ultimately. I mentioned um, financial education, um, awareness raising. That is still a very, very big topic that, uh, that, that requires attention. Um, it's definitely a very clear public good that um, also needs um, uh, public funds. So again here, if you see ideas, opportunities, scalable ones that are financially sustainable in the long run, um, SCBF is the place um, to submit those ideas. And I'm sure you will all look at those um, with a lot of enthusiasm um, and critically also making sure that they are um, scalable and sustainable in the long run. So with this uh, introductory remarks, I wish you fruitful um, General Assembly. I see that you have a very interesting um, agenda and uh, wish you fruitful dialogue, constructive meetings, and we look forward to have you back in a couple of years, hopefully in our new um, headquarters then. Thank you. Thank you for these uh, keynotes. Uh, thanks to Mario and to Isaac you know, for hosting us today in this uh, remarkable uh, day. It's an honor and, and, fun. and so good morning, everyone. Um, I'm looking good this morning. So, uh, if I could turn off the room. <laughs> so, we have a very exciting um, agenda. We will have um, a few key presentations uh, focus on financial education. We will also go through some good learnings in Morocco, for instance, um, and then we will have an operational overview by our um, secretariat and um, an overview of, of mm -hmm. our current uh, finance status, which is uh, key for us to have uh, that picture. So with that said, I will uh, proceed to invite you any comments on the last minutes of the last General Assembly. No comments? Fine, so approved. So now I will invite you for any comments coming about the SBF annual report. And I would like to highlight the fantastic work that the Secretariat has really done in this in this report, especially Dana. Good job. We really appreciate that. So any comments on the SBS uh, annual report? And we proceed. So we will need to add our fancy picture, take it today, and then we're done. All right. So uh, I do believe there is no point on release of the board, Dana, if I'm not mistaken. So but we do have coming forward much more support coming from Peter Best, which is uh, very good news to all of us. And we really want to thank you for that. We can come forward, we really need you. This is awesome. And so if anyone has something to add to the agenda that we would like to, to add, please jump. Otherwise, I will give the floor to Marin Richter to introduce us to the multi window on financial education. Yeah? Uh, I would like to actually uh, just say that uh, we have welcomed uh, Bilal uh, and then Andre from Symbiotics and Bilal uh, will be now officially representing Civic Insurance um, and SCBS. So we just saw him this morning, so that's a little great news. Uh, so we would like to welcome him on board. Maybe you can say a few things about yourself and uh, the initiatives that you have going to go on. Uh, it's the microfinance and Zurich. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Dara. Thank you very much, Olga. Uh, it's good to be here uh, in an official capacity uh, as of very recently. Um, um, I look forward to learning more, uh, although I've heard uh, snippets of your great work in the past from Laura and from Mario and others. 
Um, <clears throat> at Zurich, I uh, am head of emerging consumers, which is a customer segment in the area of strategy, innovation, and business development. <clears throat> And um, you may be aware that Zurich is uh, a shareholder in a relatively new entity called Blue Marble Microinsurance, alongside seven other uh, significant insurance industry players. Uh, it has been in operation in a, for about a year and a half. Uh, and effectively, in my role uh, at Zurich, uh, being responsible for the emerging consumer segment, that translates into me being very active with Blue Marble Microinsurance. Um, the mission of Blue Marble Microinsurance is very much consonant with your opening uh, comments, Esther. Um, it's, uh, there's a social mission, but it's to be done on a, um, a co commercially sustainable basis. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, exchanging ideas with this forum um, so that uh, the work of this forum and Blue Marble Microinsurance thrives in the future. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be part of this. You're welcome, Dina. We have been waiting for you for a while. It's a really honor to have you. Thank you for that. My name is not Godot. I did finally <laughs> arrive. <laughs> so, Andres, that's his week for yeah. Hello. I'm from Responsibility. I'm working in the technical assistance team there, and I basically replace Eva, who you all know from previous meetings. She's in an IC meeting today, so she couldn't join today. And yeah, the focus at the moment is very much on our side on, on renewable energy projects in Africa, but we hope to extend that also to other sectors, RT activities. Good so, Marin, the floor is yours. Oh, Hans, you want to Well, I just would like to, to mention that we have a slight change in the agenda. Originally, I, I thought that we would like to share some experiences about the post in Morocco, but we are now in the process of launching the first device study on, on our interventions in the post bank, study the money transfer and expanded um, prevention network. And before that, we would then have a thematic session by those researchers carrying out this independent drive study, possibly at the next or otherwise, if we get this time. And though we have a lot of, um, have a lot of good news and achievements, we still have also some difficult challenges, so I would like to, to exchange a little bit on this, get some feedback, and also in view of preparing us for the next midterm review next year, which would be an important factor also for the appetite of the public, um, the public partner in, in funding uh, another four year phase. Okay, thank you, Hans. Or Jaden. Any other comments? Right, John Marin. The floor is finally yours. Okay. I won. Hello, good morning for you, good night for me. He <laughs> wants to say it. Good. I put it in Can you see my screen? Looks like it's good enough. I can just check here. Uh, hello, can you listen to me? So, good morning, Juan. Can you hear us? Yes, now I can hear. Good morning. So, please allow us uh, two minutes to set up the technical things. <laughs> okay. Um, need my presentation on. Juan, can you hear? Yeah. 
Juan, can you hear? Yes, now yes. Um, we the other presentation on screen now. Okay, that's fine. All right, once more, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fine. So I will start. So good morning. I'm Martin Richter, financial educator, Exclu inclusive banking uh, expert at SCBF. I'm here with CBF since one year now. So we have also Juan Dika from Nicaragua who's joining us. Thank you, Juan, for getting very to join us. And I also have a pleasure to introduce you to Alexander Bartho. Okay. All right. I guess it is better when I see my micro. So I would like to introduce you to Alexander Berto, who is also joining us. Unfortunately, uh, we plan to have also Christian Sinobas on this panel, but uh, he got sick yesterday. So we got a message yesterday in the afternoon. So we will also try to cover his part. So the program of this thematic window on financial education. I will inform you about the expected results and the objectives of this panel. I give you information where do we stand and what is planned at SCBF. I will introduce you to the panelists and to the topic. Then we have the presentation of the panelists, some questions from my side. And of course, we will open the floor for questions from your side. So the financial education at the General Assembly here serves as the first knowledge management session among SCBF members. The triple objective of informing all members about the latest developments of the financial education window. We want to harness FINET feedback for fine-tuning the SCBF strategy for the window, and we want to receive better and more focused financial education proposals in the future. So the financial education window was created in March 2013. So as of June 2017, we have approved 11 financial education campaigns. We have also a couple of financial education projects in the pipeline, which is uh, lead in Egypt, microcred in Congo, and Singshore in Malawi and Zimbabwe. So if you look at these uh, projects, we uh, started the number 11 in Laos just this year. We have four, we are working on the final reports. This is one, two, three, and also eight. Two of those projects are closed. Um, for two, we have a prolongation of several months. And nine, ten, these are the Mexican projects. They started last year and will finalize this year. So Alexander will tell you much more about this. Actually, we have been quite open to experiment the financial education window in the broadest sense. So you can see that we have two projects that address women. One in India that is focusing on low-income women. We have also one in Rwanda to improve the financial skills and attitudes of women entrepreneurs. We have two in the digital space the digital rotating savings and the digital platform for micro merchants. 
we will hear much more about those two in the course of this panel. We have education for smallholder farmers on innovative agri micro insurance products. We have financial education mass campaign with ENDA and we have insurance literacy, literacy training with interactive training materials and a hotline. So just to give you some examples of our project work, as I said, there will be much more later. So under the uh, financial education window, we plan to create a financial education platform where the material that has been developed in our projects will be accessible for the members and the public. We also will commission independent result studies on selected campaigns. We will do the knowledge management and we will do original workshop in Morocco, most probably in November. Yeah, our panelists, um, so Christian Sinobas, as I was saying before, unfortunately he is sick, so we hope that he will recover very soon. So let me introduce you uh, to Juan Vega from Nicaragua. So he is our financial education specialist working with ENDA, Tunisia, with EMI in Laos, and also with LEAD in Egypt. He is the former director of financial institutions, public institutions, and international cooperation programs. He is the writer of books, press articles, and producer of programs in radio and television in, and on financial education material. Juan designed innovative methodologies using games, videos, interactive e-learning, and to bring financial education to 18 countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, and Europe. And he worked with more than 100 financial institutions. Just to mention some of his innovative works, he developed the financial education board game and a series of video cartoons. He developed the full financial education curricula for the State Bank of Pakistan. And he developed financial education scripts that were delivered through interactive voice messages, just to mention a few. So then I have uh, Alexander Berthaud sitting on my right. So he's the CEO of Akibo, a Swiss Mexican financial technology startup that was established in March 2015. So Akiba digitizes traditional savings practices around the world. The key product provides young people a free tool that allows them to save towards their goals. So prior to this, Alexander, he managed the financial inclusion program at the United Nations in Switzerland. He was also in charge of an interactive, of an initiative funded by the Gates Foundation. In this capacity, he provided technical assistance to more than 20 countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So before joining the UN, he was remittances specialist in the payment systems development group at the World Bank, where he co-led the secretariat of the G8 Global Remittances Workgroup, and he acquired a deep experience in payment systems. So in 2010, he was also part of the IFC Secretariat of the G20 Financial Inclusion Expert Group. So earlier, he worked for several years in microfinance in Mexico, after which he funded and managed the Envious Confianza Remittances Service Provider in rural indigenous areas. So very impressive. So coming to the introduction of the topic, I don't want to bore you with theory, but I think it is also important to set the scene and to give you some definitions because they vary in, by source and context. So actually, I always like the definitions given by Monique Cohn. So she is one of the pioneers uh, in financial education. 
So the common foundation of financial literacy is the importance of having the skills and knowledge to make informed financial decisions. It is the ability to make informed judgments and to take effective act actions regarding the current and future use and the management of money. So financial education is the process of building this knowledge, skills and attitudes to become financially literate. It introduces people to good money management practices with respect to earning, spending, saving, borrowing and investing. So financial education is a tool to achieve financial literacy. So financial capability includes the use factor. So the ability and the opportunity to use the knowledge and skills implied in financial literacy. In other words, financial capability is about bringing together informed clients with appropriate products in the marketplace. So ideally, these are user-friendly financial services providers. So financial inclusion is a multidimensional pro-client concept that encompasses better access, better products and services, and better use. So here comes the challenge, actually, because without the third element, the use, the first two are not worth much. So increased access and better choices do not automatically translate into an effective use. So the path from the uptake, for example, to open an account, to usage is still a challenge. For example, on one of my last missions in Zambia, I talked to one of the mobile banking providers. So they told me they have a lot of subscriptions, but less than 40% of the clients are really using that. So here comes financial education. So our panel today, the main topic Financial education as part of the business model. You find this term also in our um, proposal guide. So we want that SEBF interventions should lead to a sustainable business model for the delivery of financial literacy contents, also beyond product explanation, responsible marketing and business advisory. So let me come to Juan Vega. Can I please ask you to start your presentation? Sure. I am Juan, sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen and we can also hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. We will talk about the main points. Listening, now. no, it's yours. Sorry? Okay. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So we we'll start with three points, talking about the training approach, the challenge and lessons learned during several years on financial education, and then the specific result and, uh, and e-learning example for the uh, case of Tunisia. As uh, Maren just said, uh, financial education is about people, essentially about people providing them with knowledge and attitude to take better informed decisions on money management, especially regarding expenses, debt taking, savings and investment. So the key aspect in financial education is to start providing very simple, very useful and very relevant content for the learners to take decisions that can change their life. In essentially in two topics, one, reduce unnecessary expenses, and number two, take responsible debt decisions, essentially for the sustainability of any financial system. So what is our te technical approach? The training starts raising questions uh, regarding real life situation, showing the benefits and consequences of good and bad financial behavior, then we go to the interactive learning with short stories that are memorable, that deliver key message and very simple to use format. 
And we complement this now that we started with the videos many years back from now. And now we are using interactive e-learning with scenarios, decision taking and consequence. So learning by doing and learning by facing consequence of decisions. Then we go with motivational follow up. It's not important what happens during the training. What is important is what happens after the training. So we make interviews using the phone, the beaches, and we document those experience to improve the content and uh, the, provide the proper follow-up, not just from opinion from the teacher, from the student, but what really happened at the field level in the house of the learner. So we have here some lesson learned, challenge, lack of clear mandate, priority. Financial institutions have a lot of uh, priorities and there is a time balance between how much time I can allocate to education and how much time I should allocate to my core business that is credit and savings insurance. Second is sustainability. What will happen after the donor's money is not there anymore? Third, have to do with time limitation. It takes time to develop videos and materials can be adapted, but anyway, they need to be properly delivered at branch level and it needs time. And finally, some logistical limitation because when they provide the training at the branches, the MFIs have some limitations. Sometimes they don't have the television, the projector, or the environment is very noisy. So it's not good for a learning environment. How we solve these problems? We started with a, an early involvement of the CEO and key staff as soon as possible. Then we try to build a business case, what we call show the core benefit of financial education, how much the financial institution will make with less portfolio uh, uh, at risk, with more savings and with more productive credit. Try to forecast realistic targets using a capacity estimation, how many persons will be dedicated to provide how many training and how many persons can be trained with that person providing the training. It's also important to consider some incentive at branch level for the people that is working in the financial education. And finally, last but not least, make sure that not just enough budget, but also a close follow-up and accountability is requested from both local staff and a real mandate from the top management keeps reinforcing the need to keep doing financial education for clients. This is a short example of how the video starts now. Uh, last 10 years back from now in Latin America, the videos lasted uh, 10 minutes. Now uh, we take three minutes, half minutes to show the learning objective, introduce the story, two minutes to show the real situation, the challenge, financial decisions and consequences, and half a minute to make a final reflection and deliver the key message of financial education. So, now we talk about results. Financial education, again, is about people. It's about providing instruments to change some attitudes regarding money management, attitude and perception. So our learnings are, one, the stories and key message are remembered long after the training. They remain in the mind of the people. Two, they change the belief because they start believing that it is possible to start saving regardless of how poor or rich you are. Those change in attitudes regarding money management lead to change in financial behavior. People start making their budget, their saving plan at home, they follow up at home. They make essentially a day-to-day -day expense prioritization which leads to more savings and to less debt problems. And with better control of their expenses and income, they have better business planning and they increase their business investment. We have here two ladies from Tunisia, the sample of their uh, uh, income and expense uh, re report, very simple as you see. And finally, what were the impact in ENDA in Tunisia? 77% of the client trained increased their savings. 32% of the client were not savers before financial education. 45% were savers, but increased their savings in 36% in average. Essentially sharing the financial education with the family, mainly daughters and sons, and reduction in financial stress. We have here the picture of some 
lady providing the training to Nitya? Are people using the e-learning uh, with the videos? Yeah. Old and young people, the same. And finally, we will play now uh, with the help of Maren, the e-learning. E-learning is key because it can be interactive, it can be low cost, it can be highly standardized with high quality, and mainly, it can be scalable. Even the microfinance institution could make a very good business financing the mobiles with the e-learning modules already recorded in the mobile. So it can be really massive. That's it for my presentation. If there is any, we can now play the e-learning, Marin, with your help. Yes. Did you know that there are different loans that come with different costs and benefits? Let's learn. We will learn financial education through a combination of 1. Videos with key messages, 2. Interactive exercises, and 3. Questions. A loan is money borrowed that has to be paid back, usually together with a cost as a charge for borrowing. عسلامة ومرحبا بكم في برنامجكم كلين سوي نشكركم على ثقتكم فينا عسلامة زيك حلقتنا اليوم باش نوضحوا فيها كيفية اختيار القرض اختيار القرض كي الحكاية سهلة لازم يكون قرض ذكي تستعمله في حاجة لازمة وتقدر على تسديده كيفية اختيار القرض فيها جملة من المراحل خليك تدرس شروط المؤسسات باش تاخذ القرض اللي يناسبك اه مالا خلينا نشوفوا زينب وعلي شنو عملوا باش اختاروا قرضهم يا زين يا اخي بطلتي ما عادش تحبي تاخذي قرض اسمعني يا علولو الفلوس اللي باش ناخذوهم فيهم تكلفه ويختلفوا من مؤسسه لمؤسسه هذاك علاش يلزمنا ناخذ الوقت اللازم باش ندوروا وندرسوا العروض الكل بي يتكلفون زيد يختلفوا من مؤسسه لمؤسسه زادة كل مؤسسه بتكاليفها فما معلوم التسجيل مصاريف اداريه مهله ومده تسديد ونزيدك زياده لازمنا نزيد ونحسب ركوبنا باش نجو ونخلصوا كل شهر ونشوفوا باش نستنفعوا بالنصائح والتكوين ولا لا لا زين بسين شوف محمد خارج من مؤسسة القروض وفرحان زيد هتنسألوه على النفار اللي عمل وي هالرح أهلا بيك يا حمادي إيش كنت تعمل غادية؟ جيت خذيت قرض باش نحل حانوت عطار باش نحسن به وضعيتي هي وكيفاش عملت؟ تعرفي درت على المؤسسات الكل أما في الأخر لقيت للمؤسسة هذه أرفق وأقرب وحدة وزيد عملوا لي تكوين في تسيير مشروعي وباش يرافقوني حتى يشتري نوقف على سجاية والمشروع يشد فني هذاك هو اللي كنت مفسر فيه لعلي فهمتك يا زينب فهمتك أي بري نكملوا دورتنا على المؤسسات الأخرين وباش نقروا هيا سيدي في الأمان وإن شاء الله ربي يسهل لكم أي في الأمان يا حمادي في الأمان ملخص كيما حمادي وزينب قبل ما نقرروا باش ناخذوا قرض لازم نشوفوا عروض كل المؤسسات وندرسوا مختلف التكاليف والخدمات لازمنا زاد نحسبوا تكلفه التنقل للمؤسسه كل شهر والسوايع اللي يقعد فيها مشروعنا مسكر يعطيك الصحه زياد مع هذا الكل نزيدوا حاجه مهمه نختاروا المؤسسه اللي توفر لنا خدمات غير ماليه كيما التكوين والتسويق والتشبيك وتبادل الخبرات وكيما يقول المثل يلزمك تقيس قبل ما تغيث <تصفيق> What are your key learnings or reflections from the story? Please type your text here. So I could type my learning here. My key learning is that it is important to consider different loan options before taking a loan decision. What I realized is that when borrowing, I need to be aware of how much I must pay. Shop around and choose the best loan option. How about you? Do you shop around before borrowing money? I have to choose between one of three. Well, actually, maybe in the future. Thank you for your answer. I encourage you to apply the learnings of the story to improve your life. You will try to identify your best debt option, considering the costs in time and money, which is the most important aspect to consider when getting a new loan. Please select one of the following options. So oh, I will try again. Now I will choose option two. Great. My answer is correct now. Two. Amount of money to pay compared to your payment capacity with this option. You can make sure that you will be able to pay for your loan.
How to select your best credit option. Click the figures below to find out useful information. Now I can play around here and I will get different information regarding my real need, my payment capacity, how to make my loan selection, and how to fill and get my loan application. After reading this, I just click next. Never take a loan that you do not really need or that you cannot afford to pay. So this is the key message of the uh, lesson. Please select which out of the three loan options below to get $10,000 should you choose. Option 1, Bank. Option 2, Microfinance Institution. Option 3, Money Lender. Okay, then I compare the different conditions. So microfinance institution seems a good option because I only have to wait three days and it's less expensive than the option of the money lender. So I select option two. If you care about the costs in time and money, probably option two is the best. Select a microfinance institution. This is the best option if you care about the interest rate and do not want to do too much paperwork. Get an additional guarantor and can wait three days to get your loan. Please select the option that represents the best loan selection. Option 1, I don't need it. I can't pay for it. I have not looked for other loan options. Option 2, I need it. I can pay for it. This is the best loan option I found. Okay, this is clearly better. Congratulations for your good selection. Thank you for learning with us. Please answer the online questions by clicking on the blue box below. So I could now take the online survey. I can make a selection here, which is the best way to make a good loan selection. In your opinion, how useful was this course? I just click down and I get my the, the correct answer to my question. Now I can go back here and just... Hello, can you listen to me? Thank you, Juan. My pleasure. Can you listen to okay. me? Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So this is one example uh, that we created in, in Tunisia uh, with uh, Enda. Of course, um, the distribution now uh, of those videos and those materials is another challenge where um, that means the training, how to uh, meet the clients, where to show and so on. So this is something really each institution and has has to find out for themselves and uh, to figure out what is the best way of meeting your clients, of showing the materials and of working with the clients. Um, maybe we come to questions later. So I would pass uh, the micro to Alexander. So hi everybody. Um, hi Juan. I have it's a different presentation. Oh, you have them right there. Okay. But maybe you want to open it from the PowerPoint so that I can. Um, okay, we'll play them afterwards. Okay. So anyway, um, maybe just to clarify, so E-Savings Club is, a, is, a, is our holding here in Switzerland and Akiba is the name of the, um, of the commercial product in Mexico. So what we do is we're a startup, we're a fintech startup. Um, concretely, we focus on, on the savings side. Uh, we've been working in Africa and in Latin America. Uh, in Africa, we're working on micro savings. Um, our key goal is to digitize digitized traditional and and very consumer based uh, savings and loan lending processes because we think that you know you have to decide what already exists so what akiba does 
and it's important to get a bit of a of a context so you understand how we our approach to financial education is is basically you can um, save money into a, a wallet towards buying something and buying something can be um, healthcare it can be um, for instance dent dental treatments and it can be many other other things um, what we're also doing is the part of the within companies let's say that you have uh, you know a factory that has uh, i don't know 100 ladies that are working there um, in the factory we're offering them also as with the same system a way for them to save within the with the application so concretely i want to focus on financial capability more than financial education because for me it's a lot more concrete um, you were explaining a bit the difference financial capability is financial education but with the use on top of it. Because for me, it's it's a bit useless to have um, tools. I mean, we've seen 10, 20 years of financial education tools who might be developed and might end up uh, in a desk and maybe there's like, there were 20,000 um, flyers printed and in the end they weren't used, no one read them, maybe because they were cumbersome, maybe because they weren't. so we decided to take a digital approach towards financial education. And a digital approach also means making it a lot shorter and making it, even if you don't get, we had a discussion yesterday in the, in the board meeting where um, this was all, well, after the board meeting, it was about whether, you know, I think there's a, there's a trade off between how much information you get through and how many people you actually reach because it's very nice to have a business training. We were discussing some business training in, I don't remember in which country, but um, and maybe there's like 100 people that have it. But would you rather have 10,000 people having, you know, a short information about how to save, short information about how to get loans or select one loan versus the other, or have 100 people, you know, 10,000 versus 100 people that get a very deep business training? In our case, we believe it's better to have a bigger outreach and on a on a shorter time, and even if you don't get the full picture through. So um, these seven key principles, I didn't make them. It's uh, from the Center for Financial Inclusion in the in the U.S. and but I really like them, and that's how we apply them um, in in um, in Akiba in Mexico through the CBF project. So the first thing is teachable moments. You need there's special times when people are ready to listen to you. Right. And for instance, if it's an app, the first thing when you arrive, you're open to listening. Right. Because you still don't know anything about about the application. Right. So this is, for instance, what is Akiba? That's when you arrive. The first thing we tell you is what is Akiba? And we're already telling you with those coins that go into the phone that it's a way for you to save into your, your money. Right. Things have to be like short and, and visual. Um, so but when you're making a financial decision, it's also. Um, you know, every time you go back into the app, it's about notifications, but I get about two, two messages afterwards. Um, learn by doing. Practice using products. Oh, here I had a video, but it doesn't matter. We'll, uh, we'll discuss it later. The um, learn by doing is super important. I'm going to give you an example in Haiti. So it's not um, with Finca. I was the lead consultant there. We were trying to get mobile uh, phone users mobile wallet users um, to repay their loans, right? Of actually, first we needed them to become mobile wallet users. So we went to a meeting to the way, the way it was done before. So basically you had one of the field officers explain, this is take 20 minutes. Everybody was sitting down, just as you would imagine anywhere else. Um, the farmers were sitting down, waiting for the trainer to explain, okay, so this is how it works. And here's a, a flyer. So what we did is we let him do, and then I asked the the clients to actually do a role play. So okay, go in front, and you're the you're the client, you're the microfinance institution, and you're the agent that's going to be cash in, cash out. None of them could do it, and just before they had said they had understood everything, right? So if if I'm a development agency and I go and I test this and and I'm even if I'm monitoring an evaluation, I just go and ask them, okay, did you understand? Everybody's gonna say yes, I understood, right? So I'm gonna check my on my book. Yes, this project is good. It worked. Everybody understood. But 
when you actually put them to do it, no one had understand, understood anything. So that's why we also have to be realistic about what we're doing and the actual impact of it. So what we did there is um, we used the role play to test it, but also to actually get the information through. So um, we were, okay, like, so the same, one of you is going to be client, the other one's going to be the McFence institution, the other one's going to be an agent. And so they arrived. They're like, okay, what do I do now? Well, and we asked the others. Instead of telling them what to do, we asked the others, what do you think they should know, this and that? And that makes a lot more sense. So that's what I'm going to learn by doing is you have to actually do it. And when I'm saying the role play, they were actually with the phone in their hands and they were doing a, transac a transaction at the moment, right? So um, I think this is very important. And uh, what we did at Akiba is, and this was not in the project, but we did it because we think um, it's a good way of getting people to learn by doing. We created a, a version, which we call Akiba Lite. And what it does is it lets people save without having to put uh, money into the application. So it's basically, they can save at home in a piggy bank or under the mattress, wherever they want, but they can keep track of it in the application. So, but it's exactly the same format. And what that allows is people, even if they don't trust in the beginning putting money, that allows them to start using the application with no risk and no cost and, and nothing, right? It's just, um, it's a way of, of, of learning by doing. So I think these are, these are things we have to, um, to look into. Then messages and reminders, well, you probably can't see, but it says um, you're very close to reaching your goal. Um, remember to go into the app and, and, and save. So these are reminders that we send, you know, just the day before they have to, because they have a savings plan, right? So they need to, to deposit money every week or every 15 days, depending on what they've decided. And one day before we tell them, remember that you're almost there. You also want it to be positive, right? You want it to incentivize them and say, okay, look, you're almost getting to your, and your objective. And there's several studies that show that actually um, people save more when they have a goal, when they can name their goal, actually, than if you give them a higher interest rate, which is quite interesting. From a, So you have to use also behavioral um, economics in these things. And just a reminder, setting goals and having reminders, that's, that's good enough for, um, for savings, at least to the... Um, and the other thing is basic rules. So this is called the uh, heuristics. And what it does is basically have mental segues into your head that you think, okay, now, uh, I don't know, on Wednesdays is the day that I go and I deposit and I, and I save. So that way you start building those habits. What you see there is, um, one of the things that we, most of the things we have, we post them on social media because that's also another thing. We also think about our financial education as, okay, the, the guys in the field and, uh, you know, with the hands dirty. But our clients are not necessarily, you know, um, they also have today, if you go to any emerging country, you have, what, 20, even in... Benin, you have 25% of the population has a, has a smartphone. But if you go to East Africa, we're talking more than 50%. And uh, so we also have to change our way of thinking. And, and sometimes I think we take a patronizing view on, on, on our clients. It's like, oh, yeah, the very, very poor farmer in the very middle of, of nowhere that's never seen a cell phone. All of our clients have cell phones, at least, even if it's a feature phone. So we have to change that mentality as well. But just going back to the heuristics is... Um, Let's say this is like out of my salary, 50% I need goes for my uh, fixed costs, my fixed spending, 40% for variable spending, and 10% for my, for my savings. So that way you're giving them a segue. It's like, okay, I know that 10% of everything that comes in, I need to be saving, right? And that will remind, that will stay in their, in their heads. Um, I don't think it's moving. Can you switch to the next one? Okay. Um, this one is funny if you can play it, but we can't play it, right? Can you click on it? No. Okay. So talking about doing things a bit differently, um, we made a GIF for the... for. So actually what happens is this little... What be, uh, at the top it says making um, numbers or making my accounts at the end of the, of the weekend, right? So you have no more money. You spent all your money. So the lady just opened... The girl just opened her 
she gets a book or a wallet, and then she just falls in the back. But can we play it? Can you think we? Well, afterwards we can play. It. Anyway, it's funny. It was shared uh, seven thousand times. It was seen by three hundred forty thousand people. That's the good thing about social networks is you can track, you know, every um, who saw it, who clicked on it, who liked it, who etc. And this. I spent uh, 38 francs on, on promoting this on Facebook and it became viral, right? And so it was people posting it to their friends and look, look this looks like you the other day, et cetera. And, and at, the, at the top, it doesn't say there, but we say, okay, um, for this not to happen to you, you know, start saving. And then there's a link to a key at the bottom. So, you know, it's, it's messages, it's themselves passing on the information and you don't have to be spending money and uh, you know trainings and etc let's use what we already have let's use social media let's use um, and and if you make it's called make it fun and it's actually one of the principles is if you make it fun through either gamification or humor it's it's easier to be shared the other posts that we do when you know the financial tips etc maybe they're seen by 500 800 people every time we, we post one or two a day um but this one is 300,000 because it's funny and so people will 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 share so use the tools everybody does memes everybody does gifts this is i mean and, and our clients are no no different than, than us in in most um, in most ways um, then adapted advice. Um, well, adapted to the specific situation of the person. This is a bit complicated because it means you have a very deep understanding of the situation of the of the financial situation of the person, which in the digital world is well depends how many cookies you've planted on the on, on the phone. But um, it's hard to know that financial situation. So in that part, we didn't do much. Um, but this, for instance, is a, is a flyer because we also, I was criticizing flyers, but sometimes you need them um, just as a way to remind people when they leave, uh, you know, to see, oh, what, what was there? So, but the flyers exist both in video and in uh, paper form and in social media. So we have them in different ways. What it says is, um, so what we did is we did a partnership with with a cl uh, dental clinic that's all across uh, Mexico. They have about 50 or 60 um, dental centers. And the point is dental health is not uh, taken care of by most uh, insurances. So it's an expensive thing and that people cannot necessarily afford. And, well, it's, of course, something basic, right? So... Um, the way it says, well, do you have the guy that has like, you know, his, um, his tooth hurts? And then, so it says, okay, well, you don't download the app. Um, but, oh, no, sorry. So he, his tooth hurts. He goes to the clinic. They say it's X amount of money. The guy doesn't have enough money. So the dentist tell her, well, tells him, download the app, create a goal, um, start putting the, your savings plan. And then if you don't have, you can uh, make it manually. You can pay in many places in, uh, in cash at pharmacies or in um, convenience stores. And, um, and at the end, you will get the, um, so you get a code. And then with that code, you can go to one of these dental clinics. So the point is, there's many, many things that you cannot afford and typically, our clients are not um, credit worthy. So if you're not credit worthy and you don't have enough money, then your only way is to save little by little. And that's what Akiba allows you to do. Um, but in terms of adapted advice, there's still much we can do. I put that one because it's adapted to a specific case, which is you know this dental. So what we did is we took our flyer and we adapted it to that, that specific case. And as you can see, it's basically a comic, right? So uh, comics tend to be more uh, red than a long uh, one pager that no one will, would read. This one is also the social part. Well, actually, it was, I didn't choose the best one. That's a pretty, probably one of the most, that has the most uh, blah, blah. I tried to keep it short, but anyway, the, um, it's about 
saving strategies, right? So you have to set yourself objectives. You have to set, um, you know, what you want to reach, set a fixed amount that you're going to be saving. Um, and, uh, well, organization, it's, that's pretty obvious. And then the commitment. That's a very important thing is you have to commit yourself to paying. So what happens is before we used to let them, if they didn't finish their savings plan, we let them take the money without charging them anything because the point was we're not, not going to charge you for your savings because it doesn't make sense to charge you a fee for your savings. The problem is many people started using it not as a savings uh, tool but more as a um, as a current account. So whenever they needed money, they were just like, okay, it's, it's free, so just send me the money. And so it just made more work for us. than, uh, uh, And also it wasn't achieving the objective, which is for them to, to complete their goal, right? So we, now we're going to start charging them when they want to withdraw money in the middle. Um, and so commitment, it's important. And then that, that takes you to the savings, uh, successful savings. My point with this is, this, for instance, we posted in, in, in social media again, and everything we do, as I said, it's one or two every day. We post things um, that can be shared, that can be shared on WhatsApp, that can be shared on, on Facebook, etc. But it's always trying to teach a message regarding savings or how to, how to use the, the products. So with that, um, I mean, one discussion, that's, I think, the, my last slide. Um, it's too bad Christian is not here because we were going to have a discussion about it. Christian had this view because we exchanged before that sometimes you don't need, if your product is good enough, you don't need uh, financial education because people will just um, take it on board. Right. Um, so I partly agree. I partly disagree. I think you have, you need a, a mix of, of two things. And it's also like on the digital side, uh, we tried to be as digital as possible, but we also did about 2,000, we trained about 2,000 um, people in person uh, through universities, public universities in outside of, of Mexico City and in, in little towns or in, in cities, trying to get the message through. But that wasn't a training of, look, Akiba, this is what, do, what Akiba does. It was training on, on financial um, tools. So how do you create a how to have a budget, how to avoid spending a micro spend, you know, like you're spending on a bottle of Coca-Cola and every day. So save that and then you will have money at the end. So we're, and everybody was, or inflation, for instance, inflation is something people don't necessarily um, know about or, or once you tell them, they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But so we gave that those trainings and at the end for five minutes, we would talk about Akiba, but after explaining all of the other, it just became um, logical that it was a good idea to use Akiba. So in the end, these trainings ended up also as a, and that's how we meant it as well, of course, but as a business tool. And I think that's for the discussion afterwards is how do you make this um, into a sustainable um, part of your business? Which for me, if it brings me informed clients, it's, it's part of my business. I want that, right? Why? Because an informed client, well, first of all, it's, he's going to know about the, the application, so he's going to use it, and he can tell his friends. So you actually get uh, prescri prescribers that are going to prescribe your, your, your tool or your application or your platform to someone else. And um, so the other thing is, and I think that's where the, the subsidies are important is building these tools is important. So having um, someone like a, an external consultant, you know, telling us, so we, we hired a, um, a lady, uh, Ursula Hyman, it's her name, and she used to work at the German Savings Corporation in, in Mexico. But the point is she gave us tools. We added also other tools that were uh, from our experience. And from that, now we can replicate. Now, I mean, she hasn't been involved for 10 months, probably, in the, in the project. But with that, I tell the designer, okay, today I will, or this month, you do, uh, you know, 10 financial tips and you do three this. And he already knows what is the, the content that needs to go in there. So I think that's the, for me, that's the purpose of financial education is, of the subsidy, sorry, is should be, okay, you build the tools, you test them, and then 
thanks to the digital channel, it doesn't cost me much. It's just, well, the cost of the designer, but apart from that, it's just posting it there, and you can also post it on the, um, on the application. But we have to, someone was talking about the use. One of the biggest issue, the advantage of, the, of digital is delivery is for free. The disadvantage is that use might not be there. So you might have a very nice product, but no one, no one actually uses it. Um, so why? Because there's so many competing things in the digital world that if your video is boring, um, no one will click on it, right? So, and, and financial education is not always a funny thing, right? It, it tends to be a boring topic. So, um, oh, it's, sorry, <laughs> sorry about being frank, but it tends to be boring. So you have to find ways of making it um, used by your, by your customers. And, and I think we can discuss that. Thank you very much, Alexander. I think it's uh, really showing now, and I'm glad to see that this is really the next generation of the traditional savings clubs, uh, the Roscas and uh, the however all the names were in different parts of the world. So it's also nice to see uh, uh, that things are really developing into digital. <laughs> so uh, actually, Alexander has uh, partially already answered my first question that is actually, um, financial education is very donor focused still and uh, SCBF of course wants to give an impulse and uh, first push to the financial education campaign. So I would like to discuss what should be subsidized and what not. So uh, Alexander uh, said already, um, what is important in the first step is the development of tools and the testing. So then that, then that, uh, um, uh, that the institutions can go on and also see the benefits. Juan, uh, what yeah, do I you have to <laughs> Well, it's interesting to see that we have many things in common with uh, Akiva, learn by doing, the financial tips, the motivational follow-ups, the make it digital. So uh, answering your question, I think it's important to not... Okay, it's good to finance the tool. There have to be some tools, some mechanism to deliver knowledge or to make some uh, use of money decisions. But we also need to have some mechanism implemented to provide the follow-up and the motivational follow-up for the people to apply it. As Alexander said, you may deliver something wonderful, but nobody's using it. So the key aspect is how we could take advantage, let's say on the mobile, of some, the, the follow-up can be even made by a robot. Now in artificial intelligence and several parallel development using mobiles are evolving uh, and it's uh, cost affordable now to do it. So maybe it's good to finance the development of things, but also think about how we could uh, subsidize the follow-up to make sure that things will be will happen at the field level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very important point because uh, once the tools are there, they have to be tested. We have to see whether the clients respond to it, uh, how how they receive how, how they receive it, and uh, they have they may have to be adapted also in the course of of a project. So this this is a process that takes time and uh, this can be also quite costly, I guess. So I think this would be also something uh, to subsidize from, from our side. Alexander, do you have any other thoughts? Well, <clears throat> I think in my major worry with the, with the subsidies is that what you see is when we all know is that when they finish then what happens with the, with the project, right? Um, and so, for instance, in the example of, of, of Finca, well, Finca wasn't a financial education project, it was a, a PU, but, you know, when it finished, 
they felt that they still needed people to to continue so we we gave a, a second one and i am the monitor of the project and so they told me oh and can we have a third one and i was like no i mean that's <laughs> that's it right because then it becomes just this uh, uh this this uh, customary thing of you know and um now that you you think I, you're, you're making money, so well, not in Haiti, they're not making much money, but um, you know, it should be part of your. At some point, it has to be part of your business model, and that's what I was going to with the with this. Um, I think the major issue is is more that we see it again, or as a CEO of a company, you see financial education as a nice to have, right, and. And I think for me, it's the other hand of the marketing. So for me, it's you have to see it as part of your marketing expense, because and this might not be very, uh, you know, um, how do you say, uh, mainstream. But financial education is. If can someone tell me what's the concrete difference between marketing and financial education? It was, it was said by Juan that um, effective uh, financial education would, by by banking institutions, would lead would lead to savings mobilization, as well as reduce debt problems. So it is a direct impact on on operational um, performance, mm -hmm. and there are. For the, the social performance um, t task force, there are already empirical studies um, with, with a database of um, four or five hundred plus MFIs that verify that there is a positive correlation between, um, well, social performance practices that include financial education as well as the financial performance, particularly in, in lending. So if if the client is more informed um, and would better know how to deal with its um, uh, money management, so there will be then less cost for financial institutions to in in terms of um, trying to collect uh, loan amounts, so it is a directly built-in business incentive. So for me, it's it's much more than marketing. It is the other side of the coin of um, so-called financial performance because it's social performance, and in most areas there's a positive correlation that has been verified by empirical studies by by series. I, I, agree, I agree, but it, so the, what's interesting is that it actually does both things. You get informed customers, which are better, as you say, I agree that it brings you, you know, better repayment terms, etc. But on top of that, they know about how to use your product. So it's, you get, it's better than marketing, if you will, because it serves two purposes. One, it makes, makes them knowledgeable and, and informed. And and marketing only makes them knowledge, not only makes them uh, know that you exist. Whereas financial education. So my point was, if you're, uh, I'm convinced. But if you're a CEO of a company or of, of a financial institution, I don't understand why you wouldn't be interested in financial education. That's my. That's more of my my point. I have a question <clears throat> to the same. So, um, do we have information about um, this question regarding credit? uptake because um, in markets where we are um, maturing and there's over indebtedness risk um, I see there's a conflict of interest um, naturally for any institution who's lending uh, to do the financial literacy and then we say we measure the impact of this by the uptake because there is a thing there's not a thing like too much savings that's one story you cannot save yourself to death but you can borrow yourself to death, right? So the question is, what do we know about this um, impact on the, on the credit side? Because my feeling is that uh, in the field, if you go to institutions, they all come from conferences, they talk about financial literacy, they start their campaign, and the implicit purpose of this is actually to sell more credit. 
where I would ask, okay, there has to be a red line somewhere in between, which is blurred. I can't see that. So what, what do we know about this? Do we have information on, of, of evidence? I don't have that information, but I have not a good feeling regarding that. There is something gray. We talk white, but in particular, it's in some cases, it's gray or black, what we are doing here. Maybe... Uh, Can I say something? Yes, okay. Uh, yes. yes, the question is quite relevant. And the experience shows that uh, the financial crisis were caused by the lack of financial education. So, yes, there is a conflict of interest because I want to make more credit, I want people to take debt, but by the other side, I need to survive and I need to have a good uh, quality in my credit portfolio to be able to do that. And financial education can take a role there. But this is not the only way to deliver financial education. For instance, in Pakistan, uh, working with the Central Bank of Pakistan, we delivered the whole curricula for the school from six years old up to 24 years old, university, school, and child. And the educational institutions have to be involved to provide good quality financial education. And as long as the teachers are not so well experienced, most of the teachers are already broken, they are not good in money management, then we need also to find a way to put financial education in the mobile so the kids can learn by playing about how to manage their money. So it's a complementary aspect that both uh, financial institution, educational institutions, and the delivery of financial education using technology and more and more uh, artificial intelligence or interactive mechanisms have to be complementary. If we don't take that, of course, we can keep, uh, I was a few days back from now in Miami, and I see turn on the TV and everybody was in the television was saying, take credit, take credit, take credit, take credit. They are going again to have a, a crisis at but as they had some years ago. So it's a matter of, there is a conflict of interest, but there is a need to survive also. Thank you, Juan. Uh, just a comment on this uh, differentiation between financial education and also marketing. I mean, for me, financial education is a, a character of a public good, right? You're teaching someone something you could also maybe learn in school or maybe you would learn it in school in Switzerland. So that's this element that also requires maybe public money. But on, on the marketing side, for me, that's a tool to drive someone towards a, a very specific product or organization, right? The, there's the commercial thing behind it. It's, it's part of the marketing and, and, and sales. I think the video was a, a good example, which we've seen before, because there you could select between different options on, on the loan and the credit side. Um, but then it was in the end not about what's the best product. It's that you go to the microfinance institution, not to the bank and not to the money lender. You know? So implicitly, you also drive the clients towards the MFI and, and you give this connotation banks and, and money lenders are in a way bad and they don't give the right service, right? Or that, that's something you could interpret in, into this e-learning. So for me, that, that's the borderline, I think. Um, we also have to be responsible when we do that, right? I, I, I just want shortly to, to, to re respond to Michael's very interesting comment. I mean, all our financial education campaigns were basically linked to, to, to savings and, and um, insurance and new digital transfer products so, so never to, to credit but I would like to, to, to pass your your question on to to Juan um, in regard to the necessary um, okay the motivation to follow up and if we are talking about the field staff um, field staff would only follow if the incentive structure is aligned and that is the challenge because even in in very uh, double bottom line financial institutions uh, where management and, and down the line everyone says, okay, um, financial education is very important. But when it really boils down to, to the incentives of field credit stuff, it's, 
it's I I never have really seen um, other than quantitative targets, what is the caseload, how many loan disbursements um, per month and okay, quality of, of loan portfolio, but never anything else in regard, okay, how well informed the customers are, how much um, time is spent to make sure that that the client is really in, in, involved. So that that goes back to what what you said, uh, Juan, that the first entry point is to help the CEO to make a cost-benefit analysis, and that is very important. So it's it's not really public good is one thing for for curricula, also for for schools and so on, but it is a cost-benefit analysis, and and how how this would include really that. Okay, in regard to Michael's comment, the, the, the lending that there is the right incentives, the right red lines built in, in, in uh, if you are convincing a CEO to engage in a financial education um, approach. I think, Hans, you are fully right. The most important thing is, this is a strategic decision. If I am the CEO of a financial institution, I need to make a balance. How much uh, effort I'm going to put from my team, from my people to deliver financial education. And to do that, I need to be convinced that the effects and the benefit of this financial education will be there. So the more and more we are working on this, we are uh, putting more emphasis on developing the business case to show that uh, the, the difference between people trained and people non-trained in financial education. And we are also uh, putting a lot of emphasis in make sure that there will be at least one on, or two champions in the head office and some champions at branch level that are responsible to give the follow-up uh, for the financial education. If the people is there, and they have the time allocation to keep doing that, they will keep doing it. Uh, it's a challenge and not all the CEOs take decision based uh, on this type of cost benefit analysis. They just, sometimes they just think on the short term, I need to grow, I need to reduce my past due credit portfolio and uh, let the focus more time on credit and on financial education. It's a challenge, but as long as more institutions will uh, apply this uh, approach and we use more technology to use less time of the loan officers, like with the e-learning you just have seen, we can make it more uh, sustainable. Thank you, Juan. Yeah, Manja, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm missing a key word here that for me is, is an enabler to um, credit and it's uh, insurance. And the question to you is, have you experienced a change in behaving by those customers that have been educated beforehand, not only explaining what, what the elements of, of the capacity of the financial education is all about, but also mentioning about risk management measures, what insurance is all about. Have you seen any change in behaving by customers as they have beforehand an insurance cover by having, having faster access to finance, number one, the bank reacting totally different against by saying, okay, my default is already covered. And so how do you see this going forward? And I'm not talking here about the bundling product. I'm not talking about bundling. I'm talking about insurance as a part of the financial education campaign to enable those customers to assess to further investments. Okay, I can jump in. And in Indonesia, we are working with Swiss Re and uh, developing a campaign to promote uh, insurance education using IBR, interactive voice response. So the people listen in the telephone, some um, a voice message, and they can interact with the robot. And uh, this uh, campaign is uh, uh, oriented to develop more 
the awareness uh, on the benefit of the insurance, but also to explain more the clients how to collect, how to put the claim when they have a whatever risk is covered by the insurance. And uh, at this time, we are making the measurement with the database. Uh, of course, there are several challenges when you do it in a massive way. How many people really answer the phone? How many people listen the message to the end? How many people interact with the mobile? But at the end, my reflection is that when we deliver a very short key message or very short story, that message, is it well done? Is it uh, properly uh, managed on a communication um, style? It remains on the head of the people. Then it's up to the people to take the decision. But if you present them the benefits and you show them that it can be done in an easy way, more and more people can take decisions on this. At this time, uh, we have not still received the, message, the, the measurement of the effectiveness of the IBR, but we will uh, probably have results in July. And I will share those with uh, Hans if Swissery uh, allows uh, we to do that. But I th just um, on that, I think uh, one of the key issues we, I, there is in financial education, it's also on the other, but to really know whether it has an impact or not, you will need to have a test group before you actually do that. And that's very expensive. I mean, we, we don't do test groups uh, typically in, I guess, in a CBF when we, when we check whether it, it's worked or not. So without a test group, you cannot really know. I mean, it's, it's only anecdotal, right? So, and I think that's something that we have to, to think of as well as things that need to be, um, sub we're talking about what needs to be subsidized. I think subsidizing um, like we're doing in, in Morocco for the, the banking side, but also like on the, on the financial education is knowing how much impact. And to really know the impact, it's not enough to, to, to test, uh, to go and ask the people, okay, did you understand? Or you need to have a test group and say, okay, you are better off two years afterwards than you were before. At least that's how I, I think of it. And, and just one thing about the, the Michael's, because I couldn't uh, respond to Michael's comment on the, on the loan. I, I think there's a clear um, conflict of interest in a, in a lending institution. A lending institution will never, uh, at least the lending institutions I know, and there's even like big banks uh, working in, in developing countries, they're not interested in their customers knowing that the fees go into, the, you know, how to calculate an actual, your actual interest rate, which is the sum of the fees plus the interest rate. So maybe they'll tell, um, like in the video, okay, well, you should compare the interest rate, right? But if I charge you 5% for opening your, your loan account, your loan, um, the loan process, 5%, that's already, you have to sum that on, on top of the loan, right? And that can change completely the, the comparison. So I, I agree, totally agree with you that there's a clear uh, conflict of interest there. Um, but actually, I don't know, I wouldn't know how to solve that because <laughs> um, if the financial institutions have no incentive uh, at, they have an incentive at people repaying well, um, but they don't have an incentive necessarily to be able to compare for their customers to compare themselves to, to others. And that's why they do that. That's why you have hidden fees and you have all this because it's a way to avoid comparison. Right? I would say if the financial institution uh, is uh, proposing they have a social mission, mm -hmm. the board is also aware of that, that they have a social mission. In that case, um, they should find to bridge this. But I see in practice, I also haven't seen it. And therefore, I think the only solution is an independent broker, an uh, independent party, basically, of doing that outside. Uh, so, um, I, I have seen uh, in, in Switzerland, uh, in the field of insurance, uh, this has been used for lead generation. So, um, there was a platform, independent platform doing the education, and at the same time allowing um, uh, insurance companies to place their products, and they would pay a fee for that, and that's how the commercial, um, uh, the commercial it was sustainable, basically, in this case. I don't know, have you seen something like that in, um, uh, in developing countries? Yes, actually, there's, a, there's one uh, 
in Mexico, it's called Compara Guru. And what it does is it compares the, the loans and the, it compares the loans, including everything. But one thing that the regulator did well is that there's, a, there's something, it's called CAT, and that's the total annual cost of the loan. And that includes both all the fees and the, and the loan. So it makes it comparable across the spectrum. But that's also the role of the regulator, and, and, uh, but not in all cases the regulator. And I think financial education, that's something that we haven't discussed, but I think sometimes the question is whether financial education shouldn't be also part of the mandate. I know it's outside of this but the conversation, but I think it's interesting. Why do financial institutions have to do financial education? Don't you, don't you think it's, if it's a public good, shouldn't the regulator also be involved in this and say, well, I want educated customers in my country so that financial educations won't take advantage of them. Um, good. Uh, I'm a bit concerned and curious about competition because we're talking about financial education and um, I mean we are in business here and when you have got competition who uh, don't uh, who are not doing the same thing as you are doing. What is the justification for you to do that? And how do you make money? And how do you compete in such environment? For the client, it's a service. It's a value added to receive some training, especially if it is a good quality. And especially if they could receive it in the phone, uh, if well done, always there is a differentiation, but if well done, people appreciate to receive financial uh, education tips or some orientation on how to manage better the money. So uh, this is part of the complementary services because with a financial institution, you have financial services and non-financial services that can link together and be part of the a competitive uh, uh, advantage of the institution, of the value proposition. It depends on how you want to manage it. And the more and more the microfinance industry is growing all over the world, the service is becoming a commodity. Now, this type of differentiation, who is providing me additional value added, in this case, like education, on insurance, on financial education, or additional advantages, will be the ones that are going to grow more. Uh, and that is something that is in the interest of the financial institutions to do. Thank you, Juan. I actually also have to keep in mind the time, so we have uh, 10 minutes left. I have uh, one other question um, regarding the technology. So what are the incentives of using technology if you have in mind a well-educated end customer? Well, I, I'll take that quickly. I don't think it's just for well-educated end customers because typically our current clients are not necessarily very well-educated. It's, um, and again, going back, for, for instance, one of the, uh, we launched them as a Santa micro savings product in Benin, and this was for market ladies. Um, and they had like close to no, maybe primary education if that, but most of them had, couldn't, um, read or write. And, uh, and that was an issue actually, because then the, when we sent them the information via an SMS that said, okay, you, you have saved X amount. Um, but they couldn't read necessarily how much, actually the numbers that was not too bad. So they could read the number. They knew they knew the first number on top was uh, how much they had deposited, and they knew the number below was the balance that they could read. But the text they, they couldn't necessarily read. Um, but my point there is, sometimes we assume that that technology is um, is difficult, and when technology is difficult, maybe it means that our product is not well um, <laughs> well done, right? So, and that's not, actually Christian uh, had the, this point about, you know, sometimes financial education is a way to subsidize poor products, products that are poorly designed. Um, I would agree partly with that in the sense that if your product is good and easy and intuitive, then even, even your grandma uh, can use it. Actually, we have a, a test with my, uh, my programmers and we call it... Um, 
Ivan's uh, mom's test because Ivan is the CTO, and uh, and so what he does is is he shows it to his mom. If his mom can use it, then we <laughs> then we push it to the market, right? Um, and and of course it's 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 funny, but that's um, you know it shows that. If if a lady that's uh, you know seventy years old can can use it on her mobile phone and it's intuitive it's intuitive enough and it is going to work. Huh? <laughs> we'll stop after a while. <laughs> um, but but anyway, so um, but I'll, I'll let you on. But my my point uh, just to just to close that is we have to take. At first, I thought we needed technological, not only financial awareness, but also technological awareness. But my point is that when you actually see the clients in the field, if the technology is good enough, they know how to they know how to use it. But I don't know what you feel about that. I I feel uh, just like you're saying. Uh, you know, Da Vinci said that uh, simplicity is the maximum sophistication. Uh, uh, we say always that if the 10 years old kid cannot use it, we have to redesign it. Uh, in Ethiopia, Rwanda, uh, many people cannot read and write, so the use of voice, videos, image, and games can uh, really improve how many people is really learning using financial education. And uh, just uh, as I said a minute before, it has to be very intuitive very simple for people to, and very attractive for people to get the message and to use or apply the, the financial tips. Thank you, Olga. You allow me last, last question. Um, affordability has not uh, been mentioned up to now. And so that's a key thing, right? Um, what are we doing? Are we talking here about uh, a social scheme with high transaction costs? And uh, what is the way forward? What is the push that is needed to, to, to become a, a game changer in, in that? And then, of course, um, sustainability comes, comes along. And then the question is how to structure or how to better use those subsidies on the ground but again, having affordability and sustainability on top of, of the scheme. Thank you, Olga. This was exactly my next question. <laughs> so uh, can I pass it to Juan first? Yes, I think we have to learn of what the world is already doing. I have, uh, when you purchase in Amazon, a lot of give opinion about the seller and then you make better informed decisions. When you have a complaint, you make a call and a robot is answering you and recognizing your voice and leading you through a problem solving uh, orientation. So I think we need to use more the to put in the public, uh, let's say public uh, network, the opinion of uh, people regarding how financial education are doing how uh, how financial institutions are doing for them so people can take better informed decisions and the use of artificial intelligence robot voice recognition interactive voice message could lower the cost uh, of course the key aspect is how we make sure that people can have a smart, a smart uh, mobile and the access to the internet well the microfinance institution have also the solution to that. They provide financing. They could perfectly well finance low-cost smart mobiles with low-cost internet access. So people could also, millions of people could uh, have the way to get access to this technology. So it's a, a way of how we see the future and how we create that future. Yeah, I I agree with Han, and, and I think affordability is a key issue, but... Um, the point is, if it costs you a lot, then you won't do it, right? Once the subsidy is out, you won't do it. But if, let's say I already have the video, it's already embedded within my application, then the cost of continuing that is zero for, for me. So I don't have an incentive not to continue it. The only thing is, 
if the product has you know little changes or we launch like a you know a sub product then yes then there will be a, an additional cost but um i think the point is the cost has to be marginal the 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 cost of continuing has to be marginal and uh, i agree with with juan in the sense that that's if it's digital the cost is is going to be marginal if if it's physical and you need to distribute flyers, then you have to continue printing flyers and, uh, and et cetera. So the only thing is you also need to, uh, well, I guess once you've tested it, you know people are using it, then it's, then it's good. Because what you don't want is to have something in your, in your application that no one clicks on, and that is actually just there sitting and taking space with, for, for nothing. But yeah. Thank you. I would also uh, like to invite you if you have some further questions to the panelists to raise them, if not. Yeah. Um, any, any Please. Sort of experience or insights? <laughs> yeah, any, any experience or insights on um, this sort of channel of delivery, I think this was alluded to in your in your comments, but I'm not sure I quite uh, quite got the point. So what I'm referring to is um, this kind of digitally delivered on a smartphone, highly scalable approach, versus one that's uh, kind of delivered in person. You know, maybe through a through a, a, a relationship channel through an agent. Um, I would imagine that there would be major differences between the two. I mean, in terms of the kind of intimacy you're able to achieve. Um, often with me, I need to be told something many times, you know, over many years for it to finally stick. I imagine it's true for many other people as well. So any insights or experiences in that regard that you could share? Thank you for the question. I think it's quite relevant to have a complementary version between technology and the human interaction. Of course, in the case of financial institutions, the loan officers have the first contact and the loan officers have to be trained and have to be uh, motivated to exchange with the client to talk about uh, money management because it, it, it uh, benefits his own uh, credit quality portfolio, the, the quality of his credit portfolio. But uh, technology has not to be taken alone. It has to be complementary with the, in this case, loan officer until in the near future, who knows, the loan officers could become a robot. Um, in, in my case, or in the case of, of Akiba, as I said, we tried both. I mean, we, we actually do both, the digital and the in-person. Um, the, I would say the advantage of the digital is you have a better tracking in the sense, although it seems uh, counterintuitive, but you have a better tracking in the sense that you know how many clicked on it, if they saw the video just for five seconds or if they saw the whole of it. If you're in person and you play the video, you don't you don't know whether they were um, you know talking to their friend, watching their the last uh, the latest uh, WhatsApp message they got, or if they were actually paying attention. So, um, but the advantage is that we can sit with them for one hour and then pass on a message which is a lot deeper than um, than a 10 second interaction with or a one minute interaction with a with a video um but it's it's a bit too early to know which one works better i wanted to do both for the same thing because i think uh i, I like to try and the trial and error always and uh, so we'll let you know uh, afterwards which ones uh work best but i my suspicion is that it's uh the digital is 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 best but you still need you still need both. I, I, I think that they reinf reinforce one another, and it depends really on on the institution set up because that will determine the tra the transaction costs. So if MFIs, I mean, this field interaction is is important, and we have now we are starting with the third MFI where field interaction is possible, but in order not to burden too much field staff, they will be equipped with, with tablets where they can then um, play videos where financial literacy messages are integrated in, in procedures, explanation how, how group, group loan formation takes place. And that, that is more attractive 
if the video is well done, it will also reduce the workload of the field staff because that person can do something else while while the video is displayed. So there is an in integration, and and that I think, um, but but it is determined by the institution set up and and the transaction costs coming along. And then in the case of Enda, this is a very big organization, and they have also their NGO, and this is basically even kind of due to their very strong social performance. It's it's even a core business of the NGO, which is different fund than the basically the the, the parent M M MFI, also the banking institution. Thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. I would love to continue it for the next uh, couple of hours. But unfortunately, <laughs> we have to close here. But I think, um, as I said before, this is uh, part of the knowledge management. And uh, we will have further opportunities in discussing this further. So uh, what I take away from, from this discussion is that it is still very important uh, to develop the tools, to test them, to support our institutions in the follow-up of uh, these financial education campaigns and also to support them in the monitoring. What we need actually is a, a sort of a business case, also a solid cost-benefit analysis. And to make financial education sustainable, the institutions also need to see the benefit in doing so because this would be the only incentive also for them uh, to continue even after the funding and after our interventions. So uh, it is our task also to leave good tools, to uh, test them and to see also that those tools work in the different country contexts for different uh, types of clients. For example, women may need uh, complete different uh, uh, approaches than, than other client groups. So, yes, please, let's uh, continue this interesting discussion. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will pass the mic open further. Thank you so much. Thank you, Juan, again, for also uh, joining us in the middle of the night. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> My pleasure. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorraine, Juan. Thank you very much. We are finally seeing you live. Thank you so much for the next. Thank you, uh, Alex, for the excellent presentation. Also, we missed this one, but. Uh, I just would like to add because that haven't really mentioned how the financial education window has involved in what we really, what we fund. I mean, there must be this generic financial education and that was the topic of this uh, session. But we also mentioned responsible, um, responsible marketing and product explanation because some of our products are completely new and that, is also one element of what we are funding. And then we even go a step further, at least so far, which is business.